My name is Melanie Davis, and I am the founder of an indie publishing company called Triumph Press, which produces the books that are life-changing and make a difference in the world. I recently had the opportunity to publish a book titled A Boy from Cracker's Neck. That boy being Captain Jimmy Galloway, a B-17 bomber pilot who flew more than 30 missions and became a member of the Lucky Bastard Club during the most dangerous years of World War II aviation. His grandson, John W. Peace II, is the author, and he wrote the stories that were told to him by his grandfather as they milked the cows on their dairy farm up in the Appalachian Mountains in a little town called Cracker's Neck. It reached number one as an Amazon hot new release and number one as a bestseller and has continued to stay a bestselling book on Amazon. John Peace is here with me as we are co-hosts of this YouTube channel, Masters of the Air Talks. John, would you share with our viewers what the show is all about as we're just kicking it off? Be glad to, man. First of all, I'm, I'm so thankful you're hosting this show. Um, you know, one of the things we talked about earlier is, you know, Band of Brothers, one of my favorite miniseries, and I share that with a lot of viewers and stuff. Um, but back in 2001, you know, the internet didn't exist the way it does today with social media and stuff. And I would have loved to have had a show like Air Talks to talk about Band of Brothers. Um, in my immediate family, you know, I had my grandfather who, I mean, World War II veteran, B-17 bomber. So we talked about Band of Brothers all the time. My brother is also a big history um, nut or, you know, history fan. Um, so we talked to him. But outside of, uh, outside of that small circle of, of um, family, I didn't have a lot of people that was really that interested in it. So I didn't, you know, and there wasn't no forums, no online YouTube as we know it today that you could have kind of... Um, you know, gotten online just to share stories. I would have loved to have shared stories back then and, and also hear stories. And, and I hope one thing, um, you know, that talks does allow people to do, I hope they will share those family war stories, family military stories. Might not even be, you know, World War II. I hope they just share some of those stories and stories that didn't get into the history books, uh, the small stories. Um, you know, I was thinking before this show, one, one of the most interesting things from Band of Brothers is when that Lieutenant Spears, you might remember this scene, when he runs through two you know German lines to get to the other side of the town because of communications and stuff. And I remember watching that with Band of Brothers, but it was probably five to 10 years later when I actually read and, and was online and realized that was a real story. Yeah. You know, I'll be honest with you, when I watched it, I kind of thought they might have, you know, that might have been a little screenplay. It looked Hollywood, but it was true. <laughs> yes. And, yeah. you know, if, if online like talks had existed back in, I mean, I think they could have done a whole show just on that one particular small scene in Band of Brothers. It was amazing. And um, yeah. so, you know, that's that's where, you know, I hope the viewers will, will tune in and subscribe and submit comments. And and um, and we'll have a guest coming on. So um, I think it'd be interesting and get some different points of view. And that's another point, uh, you know, of talks is just offering different stories from a different approach to the the eighth air force and their experience. So, um, very good. Yeah. 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 So the format, just so everybody knows the the format of this show will be during, we're, we're filming this just weeks before the release of a new Apple TV series made by the same producers as band of brothers and the Pacific, Tom Hanks mm-hmm. and um, Steven Spielberg. And we are going to be recording live shows every Saturday morning. So the way that a lot of these subscription channels work is they will release an episode of a series once a week. Mm-hmm. And um, in this case, it's every Friday. So the very next day on a Saturday morning, after you've watched the episode, you can tune into our live show where we will be talking about what we just watched and any stories or interesting comments that come through our live feed. So we invite you to subscribe so that you get notification of when each live show will be. Although we do have a specific time, which is 10 Eastern, 9 Central, 8 Mountain, and 7 Pacific. Just trying to to make that morning time work for everybody. Uh, We just wanna build a community where we come together and it's exciting to watch these shows. We, our first episode of this, 
channel actually compared the trailer of Band of Brothers to the trailer of Masters of the Air. And, and it's exciting to watch that trailer. And look, we just look forward to that show. So that will be live. And we what we're hoping is that we build a community that everybody loves coming together and just talking World War II. It could be aviation. Mm -hmm. um, it could even just be talking about our military heroes from any war um, and continue the lives just as a way to converse with each other. But we will also be recording shows with guests, such as curators of war museums, air museums, and anybody who's an expert or perhaps even an author of a book. And um, we'll be recording those during the week and releasing them as well. So be sure to subscribe to the channel if this interests you. And one more plug, and then we're going to get into this topic of this episode. If you would like to come on the show and be seen and, and talk in, as part of either our live or our pre-recorded pre shows, we do have a website, mastersoftheairtalks.com, that you can go and message us and let us know if there's something you'd like to hear about, talk about, or if you'd like to join the show. So um, with that, John, why don't you dive into this episode's topic? Well, the, one of the first things I want to talk about today with the viewers is probably like the, the first 100 pages of Masters of the Air. And then I'll talk a little bit about the first 100 pages that I wanted to talk about. And... Um, you know, Donald Miller wrote such a great encyclopedia on the Eighth Air Force. And, you know, his, and to summarize, this is a very general summarization. You know, his first 100 pages is about the formation of the Eighth Air Force. And it talks about the late 30s. And he has all these, and, and I won't go into so many details because there's so many names and generals and colonels that are involved in the, the birth of the Eighth Air Force. But the one, one belief that they had was, in 1939, they had the Boeing B-17 bomber, and it was such a piece of new technology. It was fast. It could go a long distance, and they truly, and, and, um, and Donald Miller calls them the Bomber Mafia, and they were the group of people who, who truly believed that if you had a fleet big enough of B-17 bombers, you could literally win wars by themselves with strategic bombing. And, um, of course we know, looking back on hindsight, we knew we can, we know the, the faults already in that theory. And they didn't believe that they needed escort fighter planes, did not believe that, you know, escort fighter planes that, that could be built fast, that were fast enough and could go long enough to make a difference, to keep up with the B-17. So, um, you know, looking back, um, you know, we know some of them, the faults in their theories. And this episode is a kind of a, we, we put the word verses on our thumbnail, but it's really a comparison between um, Professor Don, uh, Donald L. Miller's book and your book. And I, and listening to you talk about this, I know one of the, the things that comes out of like the first hundred pages, what you're sharing from his book, in your book, you actually share how they were instructed to hold this very tight formation mm -hmm. um, called the, the box. What do they call it? Combat, Combat box. box. Yes, combat yes. box. Yes, combat box, and and they had all of these rules that they thought would give them advantages. Well, being so tightly together, they were actually getting shot down more and even crashing into each other as they were as they were falling out of the sky. Um, and you are able to to take us into the plane, and I think this is one of the differences that we're pointing out between your book and his. Is mm -hmm. yours is full of the personal stories of these, this history that he's, he's really put together in such a, a pervasive way. It's a very long book full of details. And would you just share a little bit about how they realized the combat box was not a good idea? Well, first of all, they were getting slaughtered. <laughs> and first, and you know, um, you know, my papa was talking about, you know, you flew into these missions and to, to be in an air battle and have two to 300 Luftwaffe fighter pilots just swarming over you for up to an hour, sometimes hours, getting to your target. And then another thing that, that you know, our American generals did not realize was just how accurate the Nazi flak, when I say flak, um, the anti-aircraft artillery was. And they never dreamed with high altitude. When you start talking about 25,000 feet, 30,000 feet, that anti-aircraft would be a problem. And, and so they were, you know, so you made it through waves and waves of fighter planes 
that were destroying B-17s. Then you get to the target, and then here comes the anti-aircraft. And my granddad would talk about, um, you didn't fear the fighter planes as much as you did the anti-aircraft, the flak. Because at least, you know, with the fighter planes, you felt like you had a fighting chance. You know, a lot of times you could see them coming. They might have scared you to death. But with flak, you just, every once in a while, a plane would just blow up. Or the shrapnel would just rip your ship apart. And, um, you know, just to think about just sitting there wondering when your number was going to be up. (laughs) And you talk about in your book how they how they had to actually they started using their um, parachutes. They'd sit on them. Is that what it was? Uh, They got extra flat. Sometimes that flat would come come up and and maybe take away their their future posterity. Yes. (laughs) So to speak. that's, uh, oh, that's you know, so, you know, little personal stories like that. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. another, another thing I put in my hundred pages, um, the first hundred pages was even with band of brothers, I was always fascinated. Okay. Whether it be the book greatest generation or the band of brothers, you know, you talk, you, you share these stories of how tough these men were, what conditions they flew in, you know, a lot of them were suicide missions and how tough they were. Well, what fascinated me, I grew up with a lot of World War II greatest generation men. And, you know, I wanted to tell their stories on what made them tough. And one was growing up to the Great mm-hmm. Depression. It wasn't just about being poor. Um, my granddad would talk about, well, being poor don't make you tough, son. But these men grew up hungry and they grew up with a lot of violence in their communities. When you have hunger, you're going to have violence. And there's yeah. very little law and order in these rural communities that a lot of these men came from. And there was little, there was very little law and order even in urban areas. And I know in your book you you talk about a, a shooting at the church. <laughs> yes, two of them. well, it was actually one two shooting and one or nothing. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or a, or a, a pistol flying across the gym floor at the high school when there was a yeah a little bit of a disagreement. And there. and you know and these were in communities that you would have thought were like Mayberry, but no, they, they you know, they weren't like Mayberry and, and it, you know, there wasn't much law and order except, you know, with the pistol or with the weapon that you carried and stuff. So these men grew up as my granddad would mm-hmm. say, he really said he couldn't remember growing up with anybody who hadn't seen a murder. Mm-hmm. And can you imagine graduating high school and almost everybody you graduate with had witnessed a murder? Or yeah, that, a, a very that violent puts a new light on how violent today is. Sometimes I think we we get this feeling like, mm-hmm. and not to say that it isn't in the inner cities, but um, but just how widespread it was. And I think that's such an important point for this episode as we're comparing or contrasting these two books, and how I think the books I have them over my shoulder here. Uh, mm-hmm. How I think they fit together so well because I know we're reading Masters of the Air together, and it just starts right there. At the at the the formation of of the U.S. Air Force, where your book starts way before the war begins, and I think that it's such a good title, "A Boy from Cracker's Neck," because it begins with the boy who's from the small town up in the Appalachian Mountains, and how difficult life was, and yet it's the stories are fascinating and they're funny and they're colorful. Yeah. And like you said, without that backstory, we don't really fully understand the grit and the determination and the heroism of the men who flew these planes, because it's so nice to understand where they came from and what they brought to the war. Um, and, and I love that about your book. And I think that's just something really important to be pointed out as we, um, as we look at the two books side by side. Yes. And, you know, I've told other people this, you know, one of my characters in my book wasn't in the 8th Air Force. It was, you know, Birchall Staller. And he was in the invasion of D-Day. Mm. And mm-hmm. I remember after talking to him, after he'd seen the movie Saving Private Ryan. And, you know, you had a lot of these World War II veterans having PTSD, you know, flashbacks and stuff. And I went by his house maybe a week or two later. And I was asking, you know, when uh, we called him Coach, he was Coach Staller to us. Yeah. And I said, Coach, I said, how was that movie? And he said, oh, son, that was exactly the way it was. He said, you couldn't have made it more perfect. And, you know, and I said, well, did it bother you? And he got real serious and without any bravado, no ego, he looked me straight in the face and he said, son, he said, the only thing I could can tell you is the day after the invasion of Normandy, the day after D-Day. I'm sitting in a foxhole with plenty to eat and new boots on my feet. 
Mm-hmm. And if it wasn't for the killing, it wouldn't have been half bad. And then, of course, uh-huh. I tell his backstory in the, in my book, uh-huh. from Cracker's Neck. And I mean, he looked at me and said, son, I would have killed the whole Nazi army before I went to the apple orchard to starve to death again. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, love that. It's just it's to, to get the stories of these people and where where they came from and what they went on to accomplish after the war too. Because you do, he's a great example. You show how wealthy he became, and he actually, my understanding is, he bought the orchard and, and inherited got it. all yeah. the trees. Oh yeah, he got rid of every apple tree. <laughs> it's almost like he conquered that. He conquered his his childhood of starvation by just. Yeah, he wouldn't go and eat another rotten land. apple. And you know, when he yeah. said he would have killed the whole Nazi army to keep from eating rotten apple, I mean, he meant it. So, you know, my granddad, he would joke, yeah. said if he'd had a thousand of Coach Stallards in World <laughs> War II, he could have won the war by himself. And, I mean, um, wow. You know, I that, love that. I mean, how I tough, tough are you when you make, when you yeah. really mean a statement like that? So, yeah. yeah. You know, I want to, I want to kind of go off topic a little with that. It's on topic in a sense. And that is the, I want to make a point, And that is that adversity serves such a purpose. Mm-hmm. Um, because of their childhood adversities, they were able to, to go through the, um, oh man, just facing the odds of survival, um, uh, being so low, especially during those early years and just the tenacity in this, like, heck, I'd still rather take out the Nazis than have to go home. Yeah. I still love it's being to death. You yeah. know, I, I think that we all can look at our lives and say, I am, I don't like what I'm going through right now. Something might be hard. You might be going through some adversity, but that is going to prepare you to be successful in some form or fashion later on. And to kind of circle back to the purpose of this talk show, I want to hear those stories from people and it, it plays into history. Our adversities affect history and it affects the future in such positive ways. And and I think that really comes across in your book, John, um, as you show how hard their lives were and and the things that they had to confront both in war and before and after. So it's really an interesting book. Your book is about half as long as Masters of the Air. I think you're at about 320 pages, where Masters of the Air is well over 600. So right about half a, half as long. I just wanted to take a couple minutes to, to, to talk about um, Professor Donald L. Miller, mm-hmm. the author of this book. Um, I think it's good when we're talking about um, a book like that to, to put a little highlight on the author. And I hope that after I share a little bit, that you'll tell us a little bit about yourself, John, okay. John, as the author of this book. So I know I had never heard of him before um, until this series started to be advertised. And I initially I thought, wow, how lucky is he that Tom Hanks and Steve Spielberg discovered him and decided to make a movie around his book. Well, in doing a little research, I found out that he's actually known Tom Hanks and Steven Spielberg pretty well for a lot longer than just seeing this book made into a film. He um, he he has written 10 books, many of them on World War II and, and some other topics um, that are very important and historical. He's a professor of history. And um, he was actually the um, the historical consultant working with the producers of the Pacific. So he was very involved in that. And he's had some of his other books turned into um, films or documentaries that made it to the screen. Tom Hanks made a documentary, an HBO documentary called He Has Seen War um, that talks about the World War troops coming home. And um, Miller's books contributed to that. And Miller was also um, one of the co-creators and co-producers of that show. So um, the History Channel did World War II in HD, and that was based on Miller's book, The Story of World War II, which won three Emmys. Um, and so he's actually been around the, the block a little bit when it mm-hmm. comes to bringing the stories of World War II on screen. Like I said, he, is a, he has a PhD. It's from the University of Maryland. And then he joined the Lafayette College faculty in 1978. But he has also taught at such distinguished universities as Cornell, um, University of Pennsylvania, the Graduate Center of the City, University of New York, and Oxford University. Wow. So something interesting also about him is um, just in the aftermath of Katrina, 
he was um, very involved in uh, appearing on national TV, CNN, and national public radio, talking about what went on there because he has written books on, on the great Chicago fire. And so he was talking about urban disasters mm -hmm. um, and the destruction. Now, this is interesting to me, the destruction by the bombing of World War II on the cities of Japan and Germany. Um, and, and that fascinates me about him because not only did he put a spotlight on those who were doing the bombing and, you know, of course, the reasons why, but he actually took a look at the destruction that it caused. So he has a real heart for everyone on all sides of history. And so, so that's just a little bit more uh, about the author of this book and the series that's coming out. And John, let's get to know you just a little bit better as well. Well, you know, I, I grew up on dairy farm, a, sm a small family farm that my granddad had purchased, you know, when I was just a, you know, small toddler and I grew up beside of them. And, you know, one, one of the things was, was my granddad would talk about history a lot, a lot about growing up during the Great Depression, never talked about his war, war stuff. And I was all the way in high school, um, actually eighth grade um, in high school. And before I heard my first um World War II story from him. And, um, but also, you know, growing up on a farm, I was blessed. You know, he had these peers from World War II, the greatest generation that come by the farm, um, you know, between Milkins would sit out in front of the Milken parlor. And over time, you know, even some of those World War II veterans, um, you know, started sharing these stories. And, you know, a lot of them, even their families today, never heard a lot of these stories. And one reason, you know, I wrote my book, was for my children, my grandchildren, my great grandchildren. I just wanted to write down some of these stories so they didn't get lost to history or lost from history. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then I went on to Virginia Tech. You know, I've worked in you know several different industries: the agriculture industry, the insurance industry, and um, you know, very. I never thought I'd write a book, but I wanted to get these stories down um, from these greatest generation men. Um, I think they need so to be this is your first book. A yeah. Boy from yeah. Right? Uh, surprisingly, yeah. my first book. I never, you know, never. <laughs> You're thought a phenomenal about. writer, though. I, I'm uh, surprised that uh, you definitely have the, the talent in you. And well, you've written a, a few other books. You've got a, a series that's kind of a little bit more folklore, but based yeah. on truth. Um, starts with the Kiyoki Triangle, um, which is based in your small Big town. In yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that also has gone on to be a bestseller um, and a hot new release. And, and what, one of the top 15 crime novels for um, 2023. Mm -hmm. um, so you're definitely a phenomenal writer. I've really enjoyed working on and editing your books. Um, I but you, I appreciate that you took your story writing skills and started with this book. And I hope that you'll continue to write history books. I know you've had some ideas of kind mm -hmm. of bringing out some of the history in our country that that's not known very much with, and basing it around the stories that are told. So we'll look forward to more books from you, John. And um, we'll look forward to our live shows coming up here real soon, um, starting on Saturday, January 27th. Mm -hmm. We'll have our first live following the the first day of the Masters of the Air, which I, I understand we have two episodes being shown yes. that first day. Yeah, so we'll have header. a lot to talk about. Double header the first night. Yeah. So we're going to send this video out and hope that we can start to gather our community. If you come and subscribe to our channel, you're going to, to get the countdown to our live shows because we'll pre-schedule them so that it'll pop right up on your YouTube homepage. And um, we look forward to having you join us for that. Thank you very much, Mel. Appreciate it.